that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Words taken from the Gospel of today's Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Many today have turned this saying of our Lord to mean that after one has fulfilled his obligation by going to church on Sunday, they are bound, they say, to render to the world its demands, whether these demands contravene God's laws or not. I've heard it many times. I remember when someone was being buried in the building, and then they were saying this, and they pointed out to a novus order prince. When they say someone is a prince of the church, it means person is a cardinal, that, well, you are overdoing it. Are you more Catholic than these people? That he has a, a, a shrine in his house. Why would you now say this and say that? And then they use this, this um, passage of scripture, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. But that is a wrong use. It is a sad spectacle to hear many so-called Christians to not just only speak thus, but to carry it out. They serve both God, at least so it seems, and mammon. What did our Lord really mean? St. Augustine, speaking about the coin stamped with the image of Caesar, says, We are the coins of God stamped with his image, and God demands the return of his coins as Caesar did the return of his. If, says St. Hilary, we rely on the goods which depend on Caesar, we must not complain of the obligation to render him his own, but we must also render to God what belongs alone to him, namely our body, soul, and our will. Yes, we are God's own. God made us for himself. He has given us two faculties, namely intellect and will, whereby we may know him and choose him alone freely. The will is made for the good, the highest good which is God. Now, the chief way by which we attain this end, namely God, is by utilizing the right means. In a word, we surrender our will to God when we acknowledge his sovereign dominion over us and when we submit to his laws. It is not enough to say, Lord, Lord, but only he who does the will of my Father. He it is that is pleasing to my Father. Now, the devil who together with his angels revolted against the will of God strives to make man, the creature of God's love, a hater of God. He seeks to make him to revolt against God. He has never ceased to tempt and to draw man away from the path of truth. Hence, our Lord calls the devil the father of lies. Our Lord died on the cross of Calvary to redeem mankind and he instituted the mass the ren renewal of the sacrifice of the cross as a means to apply to each individual soul the graces won for us by him on the cross. The Mass obtains to sinners contrition, like we saw last Sunday, and conversion back to God and the grace to persevere and to grow in the love and grace of God. The devil the father of lies, who from the beginning lured man away from God, had his dominion over mankind effectively broken through the sacrifice of the cross and its renewal, the sacrifice of the mass. Hence, the devil has never ceased to besiege the church and the mass. His latest strike was at the Second Vatican Council, where he initiated through his agents a change of the holy sacrifice of the Mass and the sacraments, the ordinary means of grace. It is no wonder then 
that men devoid of these means of grace openly and brazenly revolt against God's laws. The difference between the old mass, otherwise known as this mass, the traditional Latin mass, and the new mass, otherwise known as the Novus Ordo mass, the new order of mass, or for the sixth, is evident to all. But like everything, we begin by the definition. Definition states the nature of a thing. Now, the revolutionists at the second, so-called Second Vatican Council, after changing the mass, define it based on this change. Whereas the true mass was already defined at the Council of Trent and even, even before then as the true and proper sacrifice of Christ offered to God in an unbloody manner. The reformers at the Second Vatican Council defined the Novus Ordo Mise, or as they call it, the Lord's Supper, as the sacred assembly of the people of God met together with the priest presiding to celebrate the memorial of the Lord. By the way, when they call the Mass the Lord's Supper a memorial of the Lord, this is really what the Protestants said the Mass was, Martin Luther and Co. So they were essentially, they changed the Mass to fit, as we'll see later on, to fit the Protestant idea of the Mass. This definition, which in fact fit remarkably the new Mass, was criticized by the then head of the Holy Office, Cardinal Alfredo Ottavieni, and a few other clergy. In the article, famously known as the Ottavieni Intervention. In this article, Cardinal Ottavieni stressed that the new Mass is a striking departure from the canon of the Mass as defined at the Second, at the Council of Trent. Now, instead of the reformers at the Second Vatican Council to return to the traditional liturgy, they retained their Protestant service and only changed the definition in the literary editions of the general instruction of the Roman Missal that agreed with the traditional definition of the Mass. Talk about open the seat. You change the Mass, you change the substance, if you change the definition, they criticize the Mass based on the definition, you change the definition and leave what to the Mass which you have changed. That is, a pure deceit. Let us consider some evident differences, substantial differences between the old Mass and the new Mass. The first of all, is, which is evident, is that the old Mass is in Latin, I'm speaking now of the Roman rites of Mass because there are different rites in the Catholic Church that use, some of them use different like Chaldaic language and Greek language and all of that. But I'm speaking about the Roman rites of Mass. This Mass is, has always been said in Latin. The reason is because the Latin language ensures unity, uniformity, reverence, and preservation of doctrine. Latin is, is usually called a dead language. The reason it's called a dead language is because it's not spoken anymore. It's not the lingua franca of countries anymore. And so being that as it may, the words used are unchanging, almost like math. One plus one always equals two, no matter what you do. So the Latin language doesn't change because it is now only used by the church. So the words mean what they have always meant. So changing the mass into the vernacular caused disunity, lack of uniformity, and of course, a lack of reverence. Doctrine was no longer able to be preserved because now you can change the, the, the languages now and it can mean different things in different languages. That was the implication of the new mass in the vernacular. In the old mass, this mass, the priest faces the tabernacle, the cross, and the altar during Mass symbolically toward God. The priest as well performs all the actions and recites all the prayers of the Mass. I remember one, a friend of mine came here and the person said, you're virtually doing everything. He said, yes, that's because I am the priest. 
the old math is man is God centered. Everything is towards God. Ad orientem, toward the east, comes the rising sun. The new mass, the priest faces the people instead of symbolically toward God. It is man centered. No wonder they defined it as an assembly of the people to deny and to take away from the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist, where the priest faces. In the new mass, the priest sits up to the side, his functions given away to laymen and women, and he just sits and forgets himself. Sometimes his mind is not even there. In the old mass, the atmosphere is peaceful. The emphasis on the individual lifting his heart and mind to God. The members of congregation direct attention to God and not to each other. The new mass is constant standing, sitting, amplified noise. It appeals to man's sensuality, dancing, noise making, the atmosphere like a public meeting. The emphasis on instruction, socializing in church, before and after service, and handshaking during. Tell your neighbor, happy Easter, happy Easter, happy Easter. You're in mass. Can you imagine that? Almost like a social gathering, which is what it is. I can go on and on, but these suffice to point to a substantial change, not only in the mass, but in the understanding of what the mass is. There's a principle in the church which the church often uses. It's, it's, it's called Lex Orandi, Lex Credendi. The law of prayer is the law of belief, meaning we pray as we believe. So the Mass contains within it, it has always been a vehicle to preach to the people the faith of the people. So imagine now, let's give you a practical instance. Someone comes into the church in the old Mass, every gesture, every word, every tone is, has a theological meaning. So even an illiterate can perfectly understand what is happening. He comes into church and he sees the priest facing the place. When he mentions our Lord, he bows to a place, he wonders. He sees him striking his breast. This thing has to do something like our contrition. And so there's something in that place that the, the, the priest is always turning towards. See this genie, what does it? The reflection is a mark of reverence. You see, it already has a meaning even without explaining. You see, acts of contrition. Why would you do contrition? What are you contrition? What are you doing contrition? Okay, maybe there's a, another life. To point you to hell, to heaven. Without contrition, you can go to heaven. All of these things are symbolic. But when you eradicate all of these things, these gestures, then you have nothing to believe. Gradually, the, the belief in the real presence is evaded, like statistically, in the West, they no longer believe in the real presence anymore. And also, the idea of reverence at mass is gone. So that's the way that the, the, would, what we are able to change the belief. This is a traditional practice. When Protestants revolted against the church's authority and church's teachings, they went away with the mass. Because you cannot have the mass and change your faith. It is impossible. So you change your faith, you change the mass as well. Hence, the Protestants who rejected many points on the Catholic faith rejected or changed the mass and what it really stood for. It is no such wonder that Paul the Sixth employed six Protestants to assist in creating this new mass. <coughs> Why? To read the true mass of what was distinctly Catholic and to provide a vehicle to a wide-scale rejection of the Catholic faith. Now this has led to a lack of understanding of what the Mass is as a result of the changes. People come into the church and they feel bored because they don't know what the Mass is. The Mass is not a feel-good experience. The Mass by definition, is a renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. To best understand the mindset 
in which you should come to the man, let us go to Calvary. At Calvary, I've said this before, and we cannot see it enough. There are three spe spectators, observers, the Pharisees and the, the Jews, the onlookers who were unaware of what was happening, and also Mary, the mother of Jesus, the holy women, and St. John. The Pharisees and the Jews were Jerry, crucify him, crucify him. They are rejoicing at what was going on. The onlookers, some of which can, I can add the apostles from a distance, observing, the apostles understood, but were confused. Some didn't know what's going on, what's going on. Like you hear a loud gap, you see a loud gathering of people and noise, you stay from far, what's going to happen for them? What is happening there? You have those spectators. And then you have those who knew what was going on, who were sorrowing. Mary, the mother of Jesus, the holy women and St. John, what was their mindset? What was their mood? They were emotional. They were sorrowing, he says. The holy women that our Lord met, they were crying that our Lord said, Women, women, weep not for me, but for yourselves and for your children. Meaning, that is what you should be doing. You are weeping, that is fine. But you are weeping for me. No, weep for yourself, for your sins. That is what we should do at mass. That's what our Lord said. But now, in this new mass, this gathering of the assembly as they define it, they come in with rejoicing from beginning to end, noise making. It gives no grace. The only time they have silence, they just do it like five seconds or five, five minutes. They just blah, 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 and it's done and they continue the noise again. Noise from beginning to end. That is, a, that, that is the mass of, of the Jews. The mass that mocks our Lord. Because, and he mocks our Lord because they call it the mass. So he mocks our Lord. And it cannot give grace. That is why the world is the world is the way it is today. They have now stripped the world of the masses we offered in our tabernacles and our altars, and now sin rages, crime, corruption. Someone said in, this, in his neighborhood, a priest in Nigeria, he has so much crusade. It's almost like every Friday night they'll come and make noise, and after they make noise, they shout and shout and cast and bind and everything. The next day, you still see those same people quarreling, lying, cheating, stealing, even being accomplice of kidnapping. But they are the ones who yesterday were shouting and casting and binding them. You know? That's because their worship is empty. So the world will be filled with sin and crime as a punishment for a revolt against God and His laws. Remember, like I just said, all the ills we face in society will be gradually effaced if we submit entirely to the sweet yoke of the gospel. The ills of society are effects of revolts, revolts against God and his laws. The mass obtains chiefly for us a fitting worship to Almighty God, offering to him his only begotten Son, and obtaining from him the grace to be submitted to his laws, rendering to him, as the gospel says, our body and soul together with all its faculties. May God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.